poco rato que o poco rato más. Sí, vale. So, a bit longer. Ok, José, José eh, Manuel, eh, puedes empezar. Ok. De acuerdo, de acuerdo. Eh, bueno, eh, voy a empezar. So I'm going to start talking a bit about the rights of peasants to seeds. Then I'm going to talk about new GMOs. It's important to understand peasants' rights to seeds, to understand what's going on with uh, new transgenics, new GMOs. So peasants have the right to conserve, use, and reuse, exchange, and sell their own seeds. And also, they have the right to make decisions on said seeds. These rights are recognized in the International Treaty on Phytogenetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. This is a, an FAO document. This includes rights of, uh, of um, peasants in Article 9, or farmers in Article 9. This is a binding agreement signed by 178 countries, if I remember correctly. The EU uh, has signed, so it must be observed. However, it's not being um, complied with as it should be. The Via Campesina is against this situation because the EU has given this uh, responsibility to the member states. As we know, there are many member states that are not complying with this document. The second document is the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and People uh, Living in Rural Areas, UNDROP, passed in December 2018. This is a document that's not binding. It's a an important political tool that is based on other binding instruments. Also, that this could evolve into a UN convention in future years. This, these documents protect the rights of peasants to our seeds. 
This includes the issue of not having to consume also transgenic seeds. So now I am going to talk a bit, a bit, a bit about the current political context in the EU. There is an initiative that's very concerning to deregulate new transgenics. So mutagenesis, cytogenesis, new forms of, trans, of transgenics that they want to leave out of the new legislation. So they want to do a reform of the legislation on seed marketing. This could be very uh, dangerous. I'm going to talk about this later. There's a focus on new genes in the EU. They want to leave out uh, certain things from current legislation. This would affect traceability requirements, labeling, and risk assessment. So these new transgenics would not be included in the new legislation. The EU wants to uh, deregulate transgenics, saying they're sustainable, they're necessary, and really, genome techniques being used, although I won't enter into technical detail at this point, but these are new techniques. According to GG Health, they are very similar to natural processes produced in the environment and in biodiversity. And they don't affect this biodiversity and they imitate nature. The uh, commission says these new techniques are necessary to achieve the uh, Green Deal objectives of the EU. There's another excuse that's being used, a possible crisis uh, in the food sector. It's a way to beat hunger around the world, they say and to solve uh, certain problems coming from the current crisis due to the war in Ukraine. There are so many excuses that are being used. They are trying to persuade us that these new transgenics are necessary and they're good at the same time. So in the Via Campesina, we participate in several uh, dialogue groups. But DG Health gave us a presentation. These new gene techniques are important even in ecological farming, organic farming. This is an aberration, we believe. This could be, they say, a solution for certain pests and diseases. And for certain situations, we have more droughts and so on. They've been trying to tell us that these are safe techniques that can even be used in organic farming. We are completely against this as the Via Campesina. 
We've also seen this. There is very little opposition from the member states, but we've seen there is strong uh, support for transgenics in some countries, including my country, Spain. Historically, it's been the doorway into Europe. To give you an example, they've used Spain to try to bring in transgenics in other countries where they're banned. We understand that this is a very concerning issue. It's a big threat to peasants' rights. Now, why do we say this? In the case of this uh, deregulation, so we, um, peasants buying or growing should be free from transgenics. This becomes complicated. On the issue of patents, crops can be contaminated. Um, peasants can't guarantee that the seeds they've bought are free from GMOs. This means that even in these crops, if there's a case of contamination from other crops, then farmers would have to be responsible for paying for a patent and even covering legal costs arising. They also run the risk of getting lawsuits. In Spain, we've seen these cases. They are being sued for using GMOs and for using patents without having paid for them, of course. This is very serious. With this traceability requirement, there's always a risk for an abusive tension in the the, the world of um, patents. And this is allowed in current EU legislation on patents. Specifically with the directives on biotechnology, 98-40. In the cases of trials due to violations, the law should be the opposite. But peasants aren't even allowed to request indemnity. Where we can't request indemnity for contamination, for example. Peasants should be able to, to demonstrate that the seeds have traces that are not covered under patents. This would be very technologically complicated and very expensive, of course, and these are all costs assumed by the peasant. New GMOs and new patents are therefore a threat. Right now, in these terms, we we are at risk of uh, prices rising. And this is because the big multinational companies, well, as you very well know, have a, a basic monopoly on the on the seed market. There are maybe four or five companies that control the market. And they would be allowed to to use the prices that they wanted. This is very serious. 
for diversity. It would end biodiversity. Biodiversity, in fact, would be in the hands of, of very few companies, multinational companies. It's also worrying for society in general, for consumers, for citizens. This is if traceability is eliminated because consumers will no longer be allowed the right to choose um, GMO free foods. We wouldn't be able to go out of this control, get out of this control of seeds. And all of the food chain with the new GMOs and their patents would go against food sovereignty. Food sovereignty is not possible if there is no regulation. If GMOs are not regulated under current law, then this won't be possible. As you very well know, the current legislation at the European level has been a very hard, difficult work. And this legislation has been obtained thanks to the work of many different organizations, including Via Campesina, very different associations who have fought against the indiscriminate use of GMOs, and if new GMOs are outside of these legislations, it would be a serious attack to society and to food sovereignty. This is an impossible situation. We firmly believe that food sovereignty has to be defended. And it's important to raise awareness among public opinion to apply pressure on member states and on the European Union. This is where the title of this, present, of this presentation, which means that we have to work together between citizens and peasants. We have to fight for our right to grow, to farm and to eat without GMOs. We need to join forces in this issue of patents so that the law is not changed, it's not deregulated. This is the main motivation of the biotechnology industry, sadly. They want to deregulate new, new GMOs. However, we now have made a first step, which is a petition. Many Europeans have asked with 420,000 signatures, we have asked that new GMOs are regulated and labeled. This has been a first step but from La Via Campesina, we believe that it is very important to continue in this work. We need to take to continue it as at an institutional level. To conclude, new GMOs and patents are not compatible with the rights of peasants, with the, their rights to seeds. And these rights have already been recognized under different treaties by the United Nations, for example, by UN DROP. So this is incompatible with food sovereignty as well. They are an environmental disaster. And you cannot guarantee that there will be no contamination. You cannot guarantee that that there will not be cross contamination between a GMO that goes into nature, that goes into the environment. And this is disastrous for biodiversity. Uh, 
these seeds are something that we need. Peasants need this, society in general needs this. We have been looking after seeds for generations. Sadly, over the past years, these varieties are, are disappearing, and this is a natural disaster. Jose Manuel, I um, apologize for interrupting. We have about one minute left. Okay, gracias. Voy, voy terminando, sí. Eh, decía que en... Yes, I'll, I'll wrap up now. Historically, in during a famine, a well-known famine is has been caused because of a lack of biodiversity. Food was a single uh, crop, such as potato. And when potato gets a disease, then there's famine. You all know this case. So if we don't maintain biodiversity, if we, if we don't maintain this genetic wealth, then this will be disastrous. Therefore, deregulation is a big threat. It will be very difficult to move back from this if it does go forward. So we have to develop our own system of peasant seeds to be able to sustain food And we have to be respectful to the environment. We have to produce quality food for society. My colleague will speak further in depth about this. Thank you very much for listening to me. And it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much. That was a um, fantastic overview of, of what is a very very complicated topic and uh, to some degree I think quite disheartening to hear about sort of the trends we're seeing in, in the political and legal space. Um, on the other hand some hope through the petition but but concern at least on my part on sort of the the juxtaposed position of, of, of peasants' rights as opposed to to the protection of some of the these uh, these uh, transgenic seeds are, are getting under patent law, etc. But thank you very much for outlining that. And if there's any questions from 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 the audience on this, please do make sure to 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 pass them on through our chat. So I, I will will quickly go to the to the second presentation just to say also to, to the audience uh, apologies for the interruption there I'm really glad we got the interpretation sorted uh, it does mean that we are overrunning a little bit so we'll continue with the next presentation we will not rush through that but instead we've been granted uh, a bit of extra time after 10 o'clock for for questions so um, um, I, I very much welcome. Uh, everyone to to stay around for that. So, uh, without further delay, I'm introducing uh, Alessandro uh, Alessandra Turco. Uh, Alessandra is peasant is a peasant, an agronomist, uh, as well as an expert in international cooperation project management in the field of agroecology. Uh, she runs herself and actively works her own 5.5 uh, hectare farm. Uh, producing cereals and veg vegetables through micro farming projects from seeds to direct sales. Um, she, as said, she's part of uh, the coordination committee of the European coordination via Campesina, as well as of the Associazione Rurale Italiana. Uh, member of ECVC in, it, in Italy, and she's also part of the International Planning Committee for Fruit Sovereignty, following their work on agrobiodiversity on behalf of La Via Campesina. So the title of uh, Alessandra's presentation is uh, Peasants' Seed Systems, a Solution and a Necessity for Peasants' Rise to Seeds and Sovereignty. Alessandra, the floor is yours. 
Sí, buenos días a todas. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Miranda, for your introduction. Thanks, Jose Manuel, for your important uh, presentation. First of all, I'd like to present our Pleasant Seed system, rating it to our way of life. We are peasants, rural workers. The way we live means we have to have a holistic vision. We need to take into account relations and factors that affect our capacity to live and to function for our families, for communities, all these networks. So we have a model of peasant agriculture. We see this as a process. It's not just raising to agriculture, it's also our society, which is built on collective rights. So customs and laws that recognize or should recognize the rights of farmers and peasants to self-determination and autonomy. So what do we need? We need to increase production of food and food sovereignty in Europe. How do we do it? We need to support peasants and others. So small farms are uh, workable. We need to make sure that new peasants are becoming installed so they can be a European peasant population. Looking at this framework, it's an essential point for farmers, but not just for them, also for people who need food. Now, why is this? Without access to peasant seeds, seeds that are selected and produced in peasant farms, in the context of farming, in a collective context among peasants, then peasants lose autonomy. They can lose control of seeds. This means they lose their right to do peasant agriculture. This is agriculture that respects the environment, society, local economies and traditions. So for us, it is vital to defend the right of farmers to keep, exchange and use their seeds in the context of farming. As José Manuel said, this is, this is in a in the context of collective rights. This comes under uh, UNDROP. It's recognized in different articles of the uh, Treaty on Phytogenetic Resources. Also, Article 31 of the uh, of UNDRIP also. So how do we define peasant seeds? They are peasant seeds that are produced and multiple, multiplied by peasants themselves through direct selection uh, in the field. They are vital to maintain uh, social sustainability and other sustainabilities of these systems. Cultivation of peasant seeds is based on the seeds and also practices and collective knowledge. They are part of the peasant seed system. This is con connected to use, exchange and sale of seeds, as we mentioned, in the context of farming activity and not just for commercial use. It is also for it to be used as mutual assistance between peasants. So what we notice is this. These systems are essential for sustainability and renewal of seeds, for exchange and the possibility of uh, survival of seeds. Uh, it is also necessary in the peasant context. What we see in Europe is this. There's 
there's a big there's lots of diversification among small and medium sized farmers so we have a wide variety of agricultural systems so it's vital to have dynamic management at farm level so we need to receive and multiply seeds in the same process as production of food this is the only way to ensure that seeds are adapted to growing conditions and if applicable climate change successive cycles of production and selection in the field mean that peasants apply the selection techniques this capacity for adaptation is the resilience of sis agricultural systems this ensures uh, appropriate variety amongst what is preserved this can be implemented later through exchanges between farmers this is what allows us to have more scope for uh, to adapt in this climatic context one of the key points here is that seeds obtained by farmers are heterogeneous they're made of individuals with similar characteristics but with different genetic uh, heritage this means a better capacity for evolution compared to registered varieties this evolution is vital to meet the uh, green deal ideals reducing pesticides and protecting biodiversity Peasant selection is complementary to public or private research. Why is this? The characteristics are seen more in the field than in lab tests. So we want to maintain peasant uh, seed systems. They need to be strategic. So keeping uh, collective knowledge and also in uh, other farming terms. It's important for that peasants don't rep uh, depend on multinationals or seed markets. So in this context, we need to look at the rules and regulations at international level and at european level currently internationally we are based on the upov treaty and uh, in europe on the sea commercialization regulations for 60 years this has been the uh, rules framework we've been dealing with This is been pushing commercial seeds. It leads to criminalization. For seeds to be sold currently, they need to be registered as varieties and catalog with homogeneity and stability. These are criteria that don't correspond to peasant seeds. These are the criteria that make it difficult for seeds to adapt. This means that a whole set of inputs are required for growing. 
So, so with monocultures, pesticides, mechanization, this does not correspond to the peasant model. And it doesn't correspond to the peasant model. One principle that's being introduced is this, the right to intellectual property. What does this mean? The person who does the selection of the variety and who's registered the variety has intellectual property rights on the variety. Then it can't be sold or reproduced freely. The first UPOV treaty from the 60s had two exceptions. So the obtainer and the agriculture uh, and, the, and the farmer could use it to, to grow or to reach new varieties or grow on their own land. Then a new uh, UPOV was reached in 90s, UPOV 1991. This reduces the possibility uh, for uh, the, the options for peasants to use seeds freely. This doesn't confirm the principle of the rights of farmers to uh, under Article 9, that all farmers have the right to produce, sell, use their own seeds. It limits options for exchange as Jose Manuel was saying it's important to push our states push our countries to ensure to ensure that there is conformity with the framework of international treaties that are binding treaties. Currently, at the European level, what we want to push is this, for peasants to take on the current industrial seed system is this, we want more diversity uh, commercially. We need a legal framework that is specific for peasant seed systems. So our proposal is this for changes. It is this. So these are not, so we don't have so peasants are not primarily seed breeders. They sell from what they grow and what they produce. So we think that they should not be subject to commercial seed regulations because we have always exchanged seeds. That is part of our activity. We think that this must fit in with mutual assistance, mutual assistance in farming is necessary for farmers. So we should be uh, subject to health rules in the context of farming and not the rules governing com uh, marketing of seeds, which are much more strict. This They come from a different production system or apply to a different production system. In this specific network, we want uh, the right of peasants to seeds to be applied. We should be enabled to adapt our systems to uh, production reality. We are in favor of greater variety in commercial production. We support the proposal that would exclude us from appliance of certain rules. Entonces, nos queremos 
I need to cut my presentation short. It's too long. I'd like to go back to what Jose Manuel was saying. We need to link these different questions. We think that it's necessary to have a unified rules framework, recognizing the rights of farmers to apply um, uh, peasant seed systems and the new GMOs should be subject to GMO rules. Using the precautionary principle, it should be necessary to publish the breeding process. Digital sequencing must be recognized as a phylogenetic resource. It is said they should then be subject to the same rules as other GMOs. We need there to not be any abuses. There shouldn't be possible. It shouldn't be possible to have patents on products derived from GMOs. This would require indicating the process of breeding organisms. So we need to understand at a cross level between um, civil society, between consumers, is that if there is no regulatory framework, it will be impossible to protect biodiversity. It will be impossible to protect peasant seeds. Peasants need to continue using their own seeds. The European framework is often used to regulate laws in other countries. So if we fight this battle, it will have repercussions around the world. Peasants will not be able to produce quality foods around the world. The worldwide population will not be able to benefit from food sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Alessandra, that was a fantastic presentation. Also, thank you for, for um, wrapping it up towards the end. But I think there are opportunities for the questions to add to some of the things that you've said. And I really hear your point in particular that ultimately um, the question of seeds and, and, and peasants' rights is, is not just about, about the seeds themselves, but it's really about seeing that in the wider picture of how society works and 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 and, and the food system, um, and really addressing sort of the the interlinkages between some of the things that Jose Manuel said in his presentation on GMOs uh, to to the issues around patents and 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 commercial seed marketing and the need for for exemptions within those systems. Um, I'm going to take us to the questions. Um, just going to pull up the document. Um, and I'm going to 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 ask for answers to be a little bit concise, so that we can make sure that the uh, the questions that have been asked can all be answered. We have until ten twenty, um, so I will will stop a few minutes before that just to to wrap up this session. But first, I'm gonna gonna ask a question to you both and like I said just, just keep the answers fairly brief but can maybe starting with Jose Manuel uh, can you maybe explain how the issues that we've we've discussed in this session on on the one hand side the seeds marketing revision um, and, and those rules and then the new GMOs initiatives how are those interconnected and why it is is it important to make links between these different processes to really win this, this battle at on all fronts. Jose Manuel, would you like to come in first? Yes. I, I think I understood the question. Basically, you're asking how, how would you link seed legislation with legislation on GMOs? 
Well, to summarize, well, I'll try to summarize. Currently, we're trying to modify the SEEDS law. And in this modification, we're, well, the, all of the traceability and control um, criteria are being reduced. They want to keep new GMOs out of new regulations. The commission doesn't want to take into account new GMOs as GMOs. So they wouldn't be regulated under this law. And they would go under the umbrella of seed regulation. Now the current criteria want to be, or um, they're trying to reduce current criteria. And they want to reduce it with complete impunity when going into the market. That means they will not have controls, they will not have traceability. This will not allow consumers to know what they're obtaining, the origin of the seeds, for example. Um, does this answer your question? It's a very complicated issue and speaking about it requires a lot of time. So this is just a summary. Thank you. Thank you, Jose Manuel. And I, I really understand it's, it's, a, it's a complex matter, but I think that answered uh, the question. Um, I, I think I will take the liberty to just move on to the questions that came from the audience to leave sufficient time. And I will direct this question to uh, Alessandra and uh, can I ask you Alessandra just to speak perhaps slightly slower to give the interpreters a chance to to um, interpret back to English. Okay. Uh, so the question that came from the audience was what about access to land for peasant farming and that is that is such a hard uh, uh, um, and difficult problem here in the UK. How do we address that, linking up to, to, to what you have talked about today? Sí, claro. Lo siento, he tenido un problema con el móvil. Sorry, I have technical problems here. Yes, access to land, access to resources in general, is very important or farmers around the world. We have a structured approach to this. And I think that during the following days, there will be a session that speaks specifically about this issue. There is a proposal, a European directive, to ensure access to resources, to these resources. Basically, what we say is that we need food sovereignty. We need more peasants. And of course, if there is no land, then we will not be able to work. Peasants will not be able to work under the right conditions. This happens in many countries, not only in the UK. The land is being is concentrated in, in big farmlands. And then the small scale farmers are excluded. They don't have the capacity of surviving and they lose their land because their land isn't as fertile. So this is an entire concentration process, monopolization process. And it becomes even harder for small scale producers, for artisanal producers, to produce quality crops. In my farm, I have all of the production of the 
Scrittura Pagana, which is the organization in Italy. And there are many small scale producers, but new farmers cannot go into new lands. These new producers are victims of agro-industrial agriculture or farming. This is uh, the farming that uses uh, phytogenic resources, fertilizers, a contaminated system that doesn't allow for quality of products. Thank you very much. Sorry, I need to, too many screens are open. I've got it back. Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Alessandra. Um, the, the next question, I, I'll probably ask you both, but I, if there's time, but I will start with Jose Manuel. Um, you mentioned the petition, and I don't know if that link has yet been shared in the chat, but if it hasn't, it would be great if that link to the petition could be shared. But is the question is, is there a current campaign or something we can all share to raise awareness more in, in the mainstream? Because um, the, um, the, 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 the ask of this question thinks that a lot of people might not actually know a lot about some of the issues that you've raised today. Yes, there is a campaign that I've mentioned before. We now have 420,000 signatures on this campaign, and it's a campaign with other organizations. Now, these signatures have been sent to the European Commission. All of the work that we are doing is on the website of La Via Campesina. We will share that on the chat or um, www.eurovia.org. You can see our publications there. You can also see different campaigns relating to seeds, relating to European legislation. And uh, you can see our current campaigns. I think that we also have some documents. They're very short documents, easy to read, and they are easy to understand. So anyone who is interested can look at these. Alessandra, perhaps you have something else to add? Yes, I will share what uh, Jose Manuel has already said, actually. There are many opportunities to join the cause, and some of these are at the local level. At the European level, we have this petition, but it has been drafted by international or national networks who have come together at a European level. It's important to connect to these peasant associations with small scale farmers because we want to represent our point of view. We want to make our point of view visible, but we also want to create strategies with citizens, with consumers. If we don't work together with all of these sectors, then we won't be able to speak to the industry, which is very powerful. By coming together, we will be able to choose our feeding, our food systems. 
Thank you very much. And then I will go to the final question that was put in the chat by Tom. So he is asking um, how we can bring perspectives from the global south into the debate in Europe with the debates having been very Eurocentric, as he puts it, despite the global implications of EU decision as Alessandra has explained. Um, Alessandra or Jose Manuel, who would like to come in on this final question? Claro, nosotros hemos hecho una presentación conectada con ese, con, con lo que es el cuadro We have, our presentation has focused on the European legislation because it's a very, it's a critical moment of revising the law. However, and sadly, this is used as an example for legislation throughout the world. We have an international framework, for example, the Treaty on Genetic Resources. They got together in September this year in India, or September 2022 in India. This year they, they will get together again and they will talk about about the real rights of farmers and how they relate to different issues. For example, digital sequencing. These are very, very complex topics. It's very difficult to go into them right now. But um, if we talk about UPOV, this is a convention that has to be signed by member states. So once a state signs this, they will be bound to this convention. And their national um, legislation will need to have a record of varieties. They will need to register the varieties, and these varieties will be bound by breeder um, legislation. So what happens if there is a farmer that has been reproducing tomatoes for generations and sees this new variety, it, and it hasn't been registered, Um, the interpreter apologizes, the voice is, is coming and going. The farmer, the farmer will lose their rights over this seed because it will be linked to an international convention. So what we are trying to do is to fight and to join among associations to block these processes these registration processes. So if the Treaty on Genetic Resources gives us the right to, to breed our own seeds, to trade our own seeds, and we need the state to enforce this right. We do not want laws that protect the rights of breeders. We need laws that protect the rights of our traditions. So we need to respect varieties, and yes, we need to respect GMOs, but not include them under the same conditions. We have different opportunities now, but at the level of organizations or legislation, there are, we are imposed, or certain conditions are imposed on us that make the peasants lose their autonomy. Thank you very much. Powerful words towards the end. Um, I think we are. We are yo quería running... añadir, si, si, Sorry. Yo quería añadir, si, I also wanted to add something that Alexandra mentioned. I wanted to say that it is very important to take into account UN DROP 
It's the Declaration of the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas. Most countries in the South, in the global South, most of these countries have signed the UN drop. So these rights are taken into account in UN drop. This legislation or this document is very, very important. It was a great step. So we have to implement this declaration. We need to make sure that countries enforce this declaration. We need to use it. We need to talk about it because it explains very well what our rights are. It talks about seeds. It talks about GMOs. Apologies, Jose Manuel. I think I think we need to. Otherwise, we'll be kicked out very shortly. But no, I think it's a very valid point. And also, knowing from the UK context, I, I think we can, we can go a long way still in, in pushing the point on on you on drop and 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 the rights that are enshrined in that. So thank you very much. Can I just use um, this space just to thank everybody for today and apologize for rushing through it. It was a bit chaotic at times, but I think we all stuck with it. Um, so thank you very much, Jose Manuel and Alessandra, for sharing your thoughts. I think it was a really interesting session. Thank you also for the uh, interpreters and for the supporting staff who were very hands-on to deal with all the technical issues. Uh, and thank you to the Oxford Real Farming Conference for hosting this session today. It's such an important topic. Um, I wish the conference and all the participants all the best for the next few days to share thoughts and, and keep learning from each other and hopefully we'll see each other again in, in other spaces. Thank you.